I only have one message to give you. I don't care what you think of me. I don't care what you call me. I do care what you do with this information because it is important to our survival as a species. What is happening here may be unique in American history. The marches you see are not protesting unfair labor practices or advocating a political cause. They are here to challenge the conscience of the wealthy and powerful Watchtower Society, better known to the public as Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses have a massive international organization with millions of members and hundreds of millions of dollars. A gift that God gave to the human race. Amen, brother. Families and peace. But this deeply committed group is not likely to be intimidated. They have an urgent message to deliver. You can't see the hurt that we feel, but we have we have so much pain because so many of us are separated from our families because of the of the Watchtower organization's rules, unfair, unkind, unloving, unchristian rules. The organization sets itself up in the place of Christ, and that is something that the Bible does not teach. The reason we are here today is to attract attention to a genuine false prophet, a genuine false prophet that Jesus warned us about. They have lied to us, they have deceived us, and we have the documented evidence. greatest dream, paradise. Surely all of us are thrilled at the prospect of surviving the end of this wicked world and living on into God's righteous new order. What a grand future awaits us. This confident statement, brimming with hope, is from the Watchtower Society's publication, You Can Live Forever in Paradise on Earth. It is this promise that attracts the new convert to become a Jehovah's Witness. The thing that attracted me to the Watchtower Society was that they taught that Armageddon was so close that those uh, who were living now would never have to die, but that they could live forever. I think one of the greatest uh, things that appeals to the people is that uh, we are taught, that we were taught, that uh, we could live forever here on the earth, and there would be peace, perfect peace, among men and animals. The little children could play with the animals, and uh, there would be no harm or no hurt in all of the earth. Jehovah's Witnesses came along with a positive message, I thought, from the Bible. God had a plan and purpose for Martin Merriman, and that is what I wanted, to please God. Martin Merriman was not alone on the Jehovah's Witness road. Statistics show that in the 22-year period between 1963 and 1985, the Jehovah's Witness organization grew from one million members to three million. Jehovah's Witness spokesman Eugene Mortensen. The increase the Jehovah's Witnesses are experiencing right now is phenomenal. Last year, for an example, worldwide, we had a 6.8% increase. It all began in Pennsylvania in the late 1800s when Charles Taze Russell came under the influence of a second Adventist preacher. Russell initiated his own Bible study class, a small group that would ultimately grow to become the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. Borrow 
drawing directly from the prophetic speculations of Nelson Barber, a New York Second Adventist, Russell claimed that in 1799, the world had entered the time of the end. That in 1874, Jesus Christ had returned invisibly, and that the world would come to an end in the year 1914. In 1879, Russell, then 27 years of age, was so passionately convinced these prophetic dates were given by God that he sold his prosperous clothing business and struck out in a new direction. With very little education or theological background, he began printing the magazine Zion's Watchtower and Herald of Christ's Presence. Known today as the Watchtower, this publication, which has grown from an initial printing of 6,000 to well over 288 million copies annually, dictates all major doctrines to Jehovah's Witnesses. During his lifetime, Russell authored a vast amount of literature, including a series of volumes entitled Studies in the Scriptures. According to Russell, no one could understand the Bible without these books, and reading the Bible alone would lead only to spiritual darkness. One of Russell's teachings was that Egypt's Great Pyramid was designed and placed there by God as his second witness next to the Bible. It would be an instrument to reveal his great plan of the ages for mankind. This measurement indicates the length of the year, the weight of the earth, the distance to the sun, etc. Russell believed his dates and chronology were confirmed by the measurements of the interior passageways of the Great Pyramid. According to Russell, the passageways verified 1914 as the year the world would end. Finally, 1914 came and went. Russell and his followers were not raptured from the earth, and the end had not come. John Knight, who was 15 years old at the time, remembers what came next. Well, when 1914 came, of course, uh, we had to change our views, just like we had to change the views later. The date was pushed forward to 1915. Then, 1918. Certainly Armageddon was just around the corner. But in 1916, Charles Taze Russell died, sick, weary, and disappointed. A massive stone pyramid stands today at his gravesite as an embarrassing reminder of his false prophecies. Through hard-fisted inside political manipulation, Joseph Franklin Rutherford, a Missouri lawyer who had given himself the title of judge, became the second president of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society in 1917. In 1918, Judge Rutherford's lecture, entitled Millions Now Living Will Never Die, was the beginning of a worldwide recruiting effort called the Millions Campaign. Not too surprisingly, it proclaimed the coming destruction of the existing world. It would happen soon, in 1925. Based upon the promises set forth in the divine word, we must reach the positive and indisputable conclusion that millions now living will never die. In 1920, the Millions Book was published. In it, Rutherford claimed the Bible proved that in 1925, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and other faithful men of old were to be resurrected, to rule henceforth as princes on the new Paradise Earth. Fully convinced that Rutherford's prophecy was true, many witnesses sold their homes and businesses and took to the road. Living in cars and trucks like itinerant peddlers, they spread the warning. As 1925 drew closer, some farmers even refused to plant crops because they believed the end was at hand. Finally, 1925 came. And, as in 1914, nothing happened. Once again, the Watchtower Society's prophecy had proven false. 
As Russell had done, Rutherford doggedly held to the story that the end was just around the corner. In 1929, the judge had this palatial mansion constructed. It was deeded to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, so they and other ancient worthies would have a place to live when they were resurrected. Located in an exclusive district of San Diego, it was given the name Beth Sarim, Hebrew for House of the Princes. entered the Great Depression. But Rutherford lived like a millionaire, spending the winter months at Beth Serene, summering in Europe. As Americans suffered through poverty and deprivation, Rutherford enjoyed the use of two 16-cylinder Cadillacs. Under Rutherford, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society became a well-oiled corporation. New books, literature, and tracts poured forth in a flood to be sold door-to-door -door by faithful witnesses. He drove his followers to labor hard for the Lord. He advised young couples not to marry, but to put all their energies into proclaiming the kingdom. Even portable phonographs were utilized at the doorstep. Because the people have been induced to believe that Christianity and religion are the same thing. Around the world, zealous witnesses paraded in front of churches on Sunday mornings, bearing placards with the slogan, Religion is a snare and a racket. <coughs> Keeping up with the times, the society constructed its own radio station, and by 1933, there were 403 stations nationwide broadcasting Rutherford's abusive railings against the clergy, politicians, and what he referred to as the greedy commercialists. On the radio and in print, he continually stressed that the end of the world was just months away. The end finally came, but only for Rutherford. In 1942, he died of Beth Serene, the house he had built as a luxurious testimony to God's name. In retrospect, perhaps the only testimony this lovely mansion ever gave was to the cash value of false prophecy. In 1948, the society quietly sold the property, covering up an embarrassing chapter in its history. Today, most modern Jehovah's Witnesses are unaware that Beth Sarim ever existed. There is not one religious With Rutherford's passing, the flamboyant era of charismatic personalities passed as well. Today, fueled by the anxieties of a nuclear age, the Watchtower Society is a multinational corporate giant, spreading its new message of doom to every corner of the globe. Standing between God and the millions of Jehovah's Witnesses is an autocratic ruling council called the Governing Body. Because Jehovah's Witnesses believe the Word of God is channeled to humanity through this elite committee alone, these men rule with unchallenged authority. Every witness is subject to their dictatorship, from the cradle to the grave. Raymond Franz, author of the book Crisis of Conscience, was a member of the Watchtower Society's governing body for nine of his 60 years as a Jehovah's Witness. His account of their secret sessions is revealing. I must say that it was one of the most disillusioning experiences of my life. Uh, it came as a a rude awakening to me to see what actually went on. I envisioned the governing body as a body of men to whom the, the Bible, God's Word, was the controlling force in every one of their decisions who really dug into the scriptures to make sure that everything that they did was soundly based upon the Bible. And when I got into the governing body, I found that the Bible was rarely appealed to, was rarely used, that mainly was a matter of discussing organizational policy and how to apply this organizational policy. And I found that again and again when issues came up, even though scriptures might pre be presented, if there was an organizational policy, that policy would take precedence over scripture. And I couldn't help but think of Jesus' words in Matthew 23 that 
they have made the word of God null and void because of their tradition. While the organization may not always consult scripture in determining policy, they never hesitate to cite scripture as proof of their authority. The Watchtower Society claims that it is the faithful and wise servant, or as Jehovah's Witnesses have translated it, the faithful and discreet slave spoken of in Matthew 24. Leonard and Marjorie Cretian are authors of the book Witnesses of Jehovah, for 22 years, they were loyal Jehovah's Witnesses. Leonard had risen to the position of elder and presiding overseer. The original belief was that Charles Taze Russell was the chosen slave. The Watchtower Society taught that the stewardship of the things of God had been taken away from the Christian churches and given to Russell. When Russell died, they had to adjust their belief to fit a new set of facts. Now they claim that in 1919, Having invisibly come into power over the earth, Christ needed an organization to announce his kingdom and administer his affairs here. So the story goes, he carefully examined all the Christian religions and rejected them in favor of the Watchtower Society. Peter Gregerson was a member of the Watchtower Society for nearly 50 years. He was a highly respected elder and served in a number of responsible positions. And as a result, I started to do some very serious thinking about things that were going on inside the organization. It seemed to me, though, that everything always came back to the question, is the Watchtower Society and its leadership, are they the faithful slave? I really wanted to prove to myself that the Watchtower Society was right. Gregerson decided to examine the same teachings that Christ would have examined in 1919 when he was supposedly evaluating the world's religious organizations. The Watchtower's latest teachings at that time were published in a book called The Finished Mystery. What I found absolutely destroyed my confidence in the Watchtower. They had said that the end of the world would come in 1914. And in this book that was just hot off the presses for Christ to investigate, we're saying that by the spring of 1918, millions of people would be dying in the streets throughout the world. It, it wasn't happening in 1918. Christ was supposedly examining this written material to see whether the Watchtower Society should be put in charge of all of God's interests on the earth, and they were guilty of the worst kind of false prophecy. In addition to false prophecy, the Finnish mystery contained a number of other pretty ludicrous interpretations of Scripture. According to them, Revelation 12 clearly shows that Michael and his angels are the Pope of Rome and his bishops. Revelation 14 mentions a distance of 1,600 furlongs, which this fascinating book explains is the distance from Scranton, Pennsylvania, to Watchtower headquarters in Brooklyn, provided you go by way of the Hoboken Ferry and the Lackawanna Railroad. The Bible speaks of the great sea monster, Leviathan. You may want to know what the Leviathan really looked like. The finished mystery told Jehovah's Witnesses that the Leviathan was a steam locomotive, and this little coupling link was its tongue. This book, the Watchtower's main teaching book of the time, included a prediction that in 1918, demons would invade the minds of the Christian church, which they refer to as the swine class. We wish every Jehovah's Witness today could read the finished mystery for themselves. They would probably reach the same conclusion Peter Gregerson did. I spent a lot of time praying, a lot of time thinking, came to the conclusion there was no possible way that Christ Jesus as a judge could have looked at this information and have given the authority that was claimed by the Watchtower Society. Still. Jehovah's Witnesses maintain that theirs is the only true religion. All others constitute the worldwide empire of false religion, the Whore of Babylon spoken of in the book of Revelation. The Watchtower says these religions are guilty of spiritual fornication with the political and commercial rulers of the world and will all be slaughtered by God at Armageddon. Only the true Christians, Jehovah's Witnesses, will survive. F.M. Geip, a Watchtower spokesman and member of the headquarters staff, explains. Well, we feel Jehovah's Witnesses are the only true religion, otherwise we would be teaching something else. But the reason is because we follow the Bible completely. To support its beliefs, the Watchtower organization has published its own version of the Bible, called the New World Translation. 
To lend credence to this translation, the Watchtower Society has deliberately misquoted a number of well-known Greek scholars. Dr. J. R. Manti, an eminent Greek scholar, was one of the authorities quoted out of context. The Watchtower Society has implied that he supports their New World translation. Dr. Manti disagrees. I have never found any so-called translation that goes so far away from what the scripture actually teaches as these books published by Jehovah's Witnesses. They are so far away from what there is in the original Hebrew and the original Greek. Dr. Manti called the Jehovah's Witness Bible a shocking mistranslation, obsolete and incorrect. You can't follow. There's because it's biased and uh, it's deceptive because they deliberately changed words in a passage of scripture to make it fit into their doctrine. They distorted the scripture in many passages, scores and scores of passages in the New Testament, dealing with the deity of Christ especially. To find additional support for their altered scriptures, the Watchtower has even turned to the occult. The New Testament, a Bible translation by Johannes Grieber, has been used as an authority in many of their publications. Johannes Grieber was a spiritualist, heavily involved with the occult. His translation was completed under the direction of spirit messengers, with the aid of his wife, who was a self-professed spirit medium. The willingness of the Watchtower to accept any authority is reflected in the words of Charles Taze Russell in the July 1879 issue of Zion's Watchtower, where he stated, A truth presented by Satan himself is just as true as a truth stated by God. Accept truth wherever you find it, no matter what it contradicts. This philosophy is reflected in the New World Translation of Jehovah's Witnesses. When early Watchtower teachings that the world entered the so-called time of the end in 1799, that Jesus returned invisibly in 1874, and that the world would end in 1914 were proven false. Doctrine was conveniently readjusted. In the new version, 1914 became the date of both Christ's invisible return and the beginning of the time of the end. This date was put forth not as theory or interpretation, but as hard, indisputable fact. Watchtower Society official Eugene Mortensen. The Holmes witnesses from the study of the Bible have firm belief in the fact that since the fall of 1914, Jesus has come into kingdom power. And as he prophesied in the 24th chapter of Matthew, the generation that saw the beginning of this time would not pass away until all things would be accomplished. That means also the end of this wicked system of things. The Watchtower Society is very concerned that time is running out for the so-called generation of 1914. The few who are still living are quite elderly, and should they all pass away before Armageddon, Jehovah's Witnesses will be faced with another false prophecy to explain. Anticipating this future embarrassment, the Chairman's Committee of the Governing Body actually prepared a document suggesting the date be changed from 1914 to 1957. Raymond Franz was a member of the Governing Body when this recommendation was considered. Now, in this document, they suggest and advance as a, an idea that... Uh, the generation that would see the time of the, the uh, end of all things should not be counted from 1914. They fix on Jesus' statement that there would be signs in the heavens. And so they suggest here that the date should be moved up to 1957 when the Sputnik was sent into space by the Russians. And they say, now this is the celestial phenomena that would indicate the generation that would see the final wind-up. The Sputnik idea was ultimately rejected by the governing body, but for the generation of 1914, time is running out. How did the Watchtower arrive at 1914 as an all-important date? Their chronology is based on the year 607 B.C., 
which they claim is the year Jerusalem fell to the Babylonians. Carl Olaf Johnson, Swedish author of the book The Gentile Times Reconsidered, is a former Jehovah's Witness elder and pioneer minister. I didn't question this chronology in the beginning because I thought the Bible supported it. I knew, of course, that uh, historians uh, dated the, the desolation of Jerusalem not in 607 but in 587 uh, or 586. But uh, in 1968, I conducted a Bible study with a man who wanted to know why historians they uh, prefer the date 20 years later. Uh, so I started to investigate the matter. And I soon discovered that um, historians had very strong evidence in their support. Raymond Johnson Brown. compiled his research and sent it to Watchtower headquarters. But, but the society's leaders were determined to keep their doctrinal system intact. I got the letter with a warning. I was warned that uh, I shall not share my findings with uh, other witnesses. To conceal the facts and suppress his seven years of research, the Watchtower Society excommunicated Carl Olaf Johnson. Our teaching on Jesus Christ is that Jesus is the Son of God. He was the first thing that Jehovah created, and uh, through him other created works were done. Now some religions teach that God and Jesus are one and the same, but the Bible does not teach that, and it, therefore neither do Jehovah's Witnesses. We believe that the Bible teaches that Jesus carries out a number of functions for Jehovah God, the Most High. For example, in the Hebrew Scriptures, he is referred to as Michael. Uh, Michael, literally translated into English, means who is like God. Witnesses believe that Jesus Christ is a spirit creature, a super angel, the first creation of Jehovah God, who prior to coming to earth as a man, existed in heaven as Michael the Archangel. Jesus started out originally as the Logos. Or Michael the Archangel. Who then came to earth as the virgin-born son of Mary. He was a perfect, sinless man. But he was only a man, devoid of all divinity. Jesus walked the earth as a man, becoming the Christ only when he was baptized. Jehovah's Witnesses hold the cross in contempt, feeling that it is nothing more than a pagan symbol used by apostate Christendom. Instead, they teach that at the completion of his ministry, Jesus died, not on the cross, but on an upright stake. Christ's body was then laid in a tomb where it was disintegrated by God, totally destroyed forever. Jesus was then recreated by the Father. Before going to heaven, he materialized in different bodies on different occasions to convince his disciples and others that he had really been resurrected. Jesus returned to his Father in heaven where once again, he became Michael the Archangel. He will never again be seen on the earth in visible form, but instead rules invisibly from the heavens. When he executes judgment over the world at Armageddon, he will destroy all but the faithful Jehovah's Witnesses. Michael, who will always remain invisible to those on earth, and can be seen only by the 144,000 select Jehovah's Witnesses who rule with him from heaven. If you should choose to accept the Watchtower's current prophecy of Armageddon, whatever that may be, 
and decide to protect yourself by becoming a Jehovah's Witness, you will find yourself in a unique two-class religion. Only the upper class, the 144,000 spoken of in Revelation, are guaranteed a place in heaven, and they are known as the anointed. The Watchtower Society teaches that the vast majority of Jehovah's Witnesses constitute a secondary group referred to as the other sheep. They have no heavenly hope, but must remain on earth for all eternity. Once a year, on the anniversary of the Last Supper, Jehovah's Witnesses and invited persons gather for this communion-like ceremony. Only members of the anointed class who are alive today, about 9,000 worldwide, partake of the bread and wine. The millions of other sheep will not take communion. The other sheep are not in the new covenant and therefore have no personal relationship with Jesus Christ. How then do they hope to attain salvation? The Jehovah's Witness is told he may not look to Jesus alone for everlasting life. As one of the other sheep, he must also depend on the Watchtower organization for his passage to paradise. In turn, the organization says he's required to earn his salvation largely by calling door to door. It's strange, but they seem able to <clears throat> teach two different things, opposite things, simultaneously. They agree that the Bible teaches that we are saved by grace, or as they put it, God's undeserved kindness, and not by works. And yet the average witness believes, he hasn't the slightest doubt, that unless he performs the works that are laid out for him by the Watchtower Society, the witnessing activity, going door to door, uh, regular meeting attendance, and other things that are brought out, that he will never gain everlasting life. Once in the organization, witnesses attend five hours of meetings a week. In addition, they are expected to devote many hours a month going door to door, selling literature and gaining converts, striving always to prove themselves worthy of escaping God's wrath at Armageddon. Even though we, we believe that God was love, we are always afraid that he was going to zap us, that sometime Armageddon might hit and we might not make it. Even if, even if we didn't go out from the door-to-door -door ministry on a weekend and took our family out, uh, out to the lake or something, we didn't go out from door-to-door, -door, we felt guilty all the time. In order to keep a close check on the activities of each member, the organization requires them to turn in a monthly time report if they want to be retained on the rolls as active Jehovah's Witnesses. We don't keep any membership records per se, but uh, the only record we have is those who actually go door to door preaching. Today, when the new Jehovah's Witness is baptized, rather than using the biblical format of baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the witness is baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit-directed organization. This is a dedication to them that is without any reservation. They are now going to set their entire life aside to do their Creator's will. Thus baptized, the Jehovah's Witness is now committed to slave for the organization until the world comes to an end. Jehovah's Witnesses exist in a rigid, structured, thou shalt not environment. They are forbidden to vote or hold elective office, celebrate holidays, belong to the YMCA or YWCA, salute the flag, sing the national anthem, or participate in other patriotic activities. They can't serve in the military or work for a military organization. They may not accept blood transfusions, read anything critical of the Watchtower Society, or associate with former Jehovah's Witnesses. They are forbidden to even attend church. If life is narrow for the adult witness, the problem is greatly intensified for their school-aged children. The Watchtower Society has published a book entitled School and Jehovah's Witnesses. It defines for schools what activities witness children are forbidden to participate in. Things like birthday celebrations. 
Christmas and Easter, sports, Mother's or Father's Day, Valentine's Day or Thanksgiving, saluting the flag or school dances, singing the national anthem or saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. Children are real victims in this. Jehovah's Witness children cannot participate in many of the normal school activities and as a result are often mocked by their classmates. They are really torn because on one hand they want to please their parents and on the other hand they want to be accepted by their teachers and classmates. There is no way they can win. They are literally torn apart emotionally. I know this firsthand because my own daughter cried nearly every day in school from the first time she entered until an extremely loving teacher made her feel at ease in the fourth grade. The life of a witness child is very isolated because playing with non-witness schoolmates and neighborhood children is considered bad association. The Watchtower Society presents Jehovah's Witnesses as clean, happy, and unquestionably moral. The Bible has a lot to say about family life, and the reason Jehovah's Witnesses have such happy families is because we try to apply the principles that are found in the Bible. This protects them from many of the pressures and the problems that afflict a family life today. For example, Jehovah's Witnesses, while not immune to the pressures and problems, are able to cope with the difficulties that husbands and wives face, that children are confronted with every day. And so we have a very low incident of family dissolving or juvenile delinquency, drug abuse, and alcoholism. And that shows the benefit and the profit of following God's word closely. Former Jehovah's Witnesses disagree. Growing up as a child within Jehovah's Witnesses, I always thought that this was God's clean organization. But when I got older, I found out that there were divorces, there was gross immorality within the congregations, and that we were actually no different than the ones we were condemning. As an elder, I saw the seedy side of the congregation. Members would come to me with their problems, and I found out that even elders were involved sometimes in crooked business practices and in immorality. And I began to discover that we were really no better than the people on the outside of the organization. When I left Bethel, it was hard for me to even share with my mother and father what was going on up there, the, the drunken parties that went on and, and the homosexuality and things like this. Finally, the Watchtower had to admit that immorality had spread to the highest levels of the organization, saying, shocking as it is, even some who have been prominent in Jehovah's organization have succumbed to immoral practices, including homosexuality, wife swapping, and child molesting. Alcoholism, depression, and mental disorders among Jehovah's Witnesses have come to the attention of psychiatric professionals. Dr. Jerry Bergman is a former Jehovah's Witness and a trained psychologist. In my experience in working for a number of psychiatric clinics as a therapist, I've worked with many, many Jehovah's Witnesses, and I find that many of them suffer from severe emotional problems, from schizophrenia, from severe depression, alcoholism, and other problems. I've also consulted the scientific literature on this question, and I found that it clearly confirms that the mental illness rate among the witnesses is clearly above average. One of the most intimidating devices used by the Watchtower Society is the threat of appearing before a judicial committee of elders. Public censure, even disfellowshipping, can be the sentence of this powerful court. The inflexibility of Watchtower policies has led to thousands of instances of mental distress, even suicide. Dottie Hike's family experienced the cold steel of Watchtower doctrine when her 16-year-old son, Billy, became romantically involved with a married Jehovah's Witness woman. Conscience-stricken, Billy turned to his parents. He was very upset, extremely distraught, and he just didn't know what to do. And he was making statements like, I just can't go on, I just can't face this. And he was threatening to commit suicide. 
My husband and I talked with him for hours and did everything and said everything we knew to do to try to get him to realize that there's no situation too bad that you can't face. But things just were not getting any better. So as witnesses, you're taught not to seek the professional help of anyone. So we felt our hands were so tied we didn't know what to do. The family turned to an elder of the congregation for help. The elder called Billy outside, and his parents felt a solution was near. But their hopes were short-lived. We felt the elder would really have some kind of words of consolation for him, even though no one condoned what he had done. This boy was reaching out for help, and he did need someone to console him. And he felt so guilty and so at a loss. And instead, the elder just said, the committee will deal with you tomorrow. He went out to my husband's truck, where he kept a small amount of Paraquat in a container. And Billy took the Paraquat, and he took one swallow of it. We had him in the hospital within 20 minutes. Exactly three weeks later, he died. <laughs> Did the witness congregation respond with compassion to this tragedy? Billy's sister, Rhonda. When he died, it really devastated me. At his memorial service, none of his friends that he'd known all of his life were able to attend, and that really hurt me. The Jehovah's Witnesses claimed to bring the families together. Through them, my brother killed himself. My mother tried to kill herself. My two sisters and my brother will not speak to me. My grandmother will not speak to me. She wouldn't let me see my grandfather before he passed away. They didn't bring our family close together. They nearly, totally destroyed it. While the members of the governing body may escape blame for the death of one desperate boy, they can hardly escape responsibility for their policies in the African country of Malawi. Policies that left thousands of witnesses raped, homeless, or dead. In the mid-1960s in the African country of Malawi, all citizens were ordered by the government to purchase a 25 cent party identification card. Jehovah's Witnesses were forbidden by the Watchtower Society's branch office from complying with that law. As a result, Jehovah's Witnesses suffered a terrible persecution. Homes and crops were burned, thousands of women were raped, and some 20,000 witnesses were forced to flee Malawi into neighboring countries to live in refugee camps, their lives scarred forever. Now Jehovah's Witnesses uh, are taught that it's a sin to be involved in any way with politics. They're also taught that it's just as great a sin to have anything to do with the military. But we have two situations, one in a country in Africa, Malawi, and another in Mexico, where Two opposite rulings were allowed to stay in effect at the same time, and it's almost unbelievable, the, the results of this. When Jehovah's Witnesses living in Mexico heard that their brothers had suffered this terrible persecution over a 25-cent party card, they were conscience-stricken. Because in Mexico, every young man is expected to fulfill one year of military service. He receives what's called a cartilla, a certificate. The witnesses customarily and regularly would bribe a military official to fill out this card stating that they had completed their military instruction and that they were now in the first reserves of the army. Why were they doing this? They gave me copies of letters from the Watchtower Society's headquarters in New York stating that this was purely a matter for individual conscience and that if the person felt he could do this pay a bribe to a military official get this card saying he had completed his military training was now a member of the first reserves this was up to him Jehovah's Witnesses believe the men who make up the governing body are chosen and directed by God yet out of apparent indifference or ignorance or worse the governing body allowed witnesses to illegally bribe officials while at the same time holding others to a policy that resulted in their wholesale rape and slaughter. It's difficult for me to believe these actions were inspired by God.
The controlled tentacles of the governing body extend even into the life and death world of medical treatment. In the 17th chapter of Leviticus, in the 10th verse, it states that one should not eat blood of any sort. This means that God does not want us to sustain our life off of the life of some other creature. And that for that reason, because God has forbidden it, we abstain from taking blood. The blood issue in the back of our minds was bothering us because as Jehovah's Witnesses, if we freely gave a blood transfusion to our daughter, we'd be excommunicated. We'd be disfellowshipped. Well, the doctors finally came to our room and they just it was just like an ultimatum. They said, listen, we know from our records that you're a Jehovah's Witness. We know that you don't take blood transfusions. And the doctor looked me straight in the eye and said, Mr. and Mrs. Blizzard, you have to make a decision, yes or no, whether your child lives or dies. I remember going over to the bed and she had these cords and wires keeping her alive, life support systems, and, and holding this limp child that was our only daughter, and, and, and just going over to the window and looking out and watching the clouds and the sky and, and just started to weep. And I said, oh God, Jehovah, and I prayed to Jehovah. We just had a real distinct impression that we were supposed to obey God's law and go by what we had always been taught and that we were to let our daughter die. And so we just called the doctors back in and told them that we had just had to let her die, that we had to obey God's law. About a half an hour later, a sheriff deputy came to our room and gave my wife and I both citations, and they told us that a court order has already been issued, uh, your daughter is going to get the blood, and they also warned the staff of the hospital not to allow us to take Jenny out of the hospital. And we were charged with child neglect and abuse. The witnesses, there was multitudes of them that came up to the room, just swarmed the room, tried to give in a, giving us watchtower articles about uh, artificial blood and, and uh, you just can't let your child take that blood and just putting this heavy guilt trip on us. The elders were relieved to find out that there was still time to get Jenny out of the hospital and they would, they would come up to me and say, hey, I've got a plan. We can get her, we can hire a helicopter, we can sneak her out of this hospital, just unhook the tubes and, and we're gone. And I said, wait a minute. You can't do that. It's against, it's against the law. I'll be charged with murder. They said, that's a chance you're going to have to take. And I just told them, look, I just can't let my child die in that way. And the elders were just so upset. They left in a huff. They were mad. And one of the elders said on the way out, he looked me in the eye and said, you know what? I hope your daughter gets hepatitis from that blood. And that was just the straw that broke the camel's back. I was just broken here. My own people. God's organization turning against me, cursing me, because I just wanted to see my child live. And so they left. And we were all alone. Even my own parents didn't come see us. I think many times Jehovah's Witnesses have really never thought the blood thing through. It's either right or it's wrong. If it's wrong, the Watchtower Society is guilty of causing the deaths of thousands of people. That's wrong. It's evil. I think the evil needs to be seen for what it is. It's this concept, this organizational concept, that the organization is everything. You see, <clears throat> Jehovah's Witnesses believe that this organization is God's one channel, that all of God's direction for people on the earth comes through this channel. And the men on the governing body believe it. I believed it. And that's the reason I was party to some things in the past that today I, I feel shame to think that I even had part in them. If the governing body of the Watchtower Society holds and enjoys the power, then they must also bear the responsibility. The truth is, they don't. Nothing better illustrates this than their false prophecy concerning 1975. Well, when the society brought out the date 1975, I felt right away that th this is going to be the date when the thing has to happen because there was no other date beyond 1975 that anybody could point to. So uh, I grabbed right a hold of it as if it was a thing to do. And uh, I put all my hopes in it. By the mid-60s, the Watchtower Society had all but guaranteed that the world would come to an end in 1975. It was a prophecy that would bring in a flood of new members, and the organization prospered. But it would have other effects on the ordinary Jehovah's Witness. We thought Armageddon was coming in 1975. So I did not have a career. I didn't go to college because the end was so close. There was no need. The new world would be here. 
uh, I was a senior in high school, and the circuit overseer, which is a traveling minister, advised me that it's best for you to quit school and go into full-time pioneer work because the world is going to end in 1975. We felt so strongly about the imminent approach of 1975 and that this whole system was coming to an end. That we sold our home in Lower Michigan, moved north, built a kingdom hall, and there we intended to live out those few remaining years, having saved just enough money to go a few years beyond 1975. And so it was a great disappointment and distress when this event that the Watchtower had prophesied did not materialize. I wanted to get married, I wanted to have children, but because the end was so close, when Fred and I got married, we decided that we would postpone having children. So I believe we sacrificed a lot within the organization. Well, when the end of the world didn't come in 1975, and that prophecy of the Watchtower failed, I began to wonder if they were wrong on this, how many others are they wrong on? And once again, Watchtower fact was revealed as nothing more than contrived fantasy. Jehovah's Witnesses tried to get an explanation, but were unsuccessful. Apparently, for the governing body, nothing is so invisible as an unpleasant truth. Today, they are quick to deny their prophecies for the end of the world. We do not, nor have we attempted, to predict a day or a time for it. The history and prophecies of the Watchtower Society are easily revealed as fabrications and distortions by simply reading the material they've published from the beginning. Their greatest enemy is their own literature, which clearly shows the man-made nature of their theology. Jehovah's Witness leaders have continually covered up and rewritten their ever-changing doctrines each time presenting them as new light. The one thing the Watchtower Society cannot tolerate in the organization is critical thinking. That's why they forbid their followers to read any material which might expose their deceptions. really shocked me to my core was this, and every other Jehovah's Witness listening to this, is that we were so convinced that the leadership, the governing body, would never tell one lie. Mm -hmm. They would always speak the truth yes. no matter what the truth was. Mm -hmm. That is a fabrication, it is a lie, they have lied to us, they have deceived us, and we have the documented evidence, and because we've spoken about it, we were silenced, or threatened to be silenced, and that's what will happen to any Jehovah's Witness listening to this program, and he knows it in his heart, he knows it in his heart. I saw in the body that most of our time was spent discussing the formation of new rulings, all designed to keep the witnesses in and to keep bad people out, to act as that kind of offense. And again and again, the decisions had absolutely no basis in the Bible. The witness who breaks these executive commandments is subject to disfellowshipping, the Watchtower's word for excommunication. Jehovah's Witnesses practice removing those who refuse to conform to right principles from among themselves. The Bible refers to this and supports this practice as preventing leaven or false thinking or teaching from entering into the congregation, thereby maintaining its purity or its cleanliness. I went to a Christian church with my husband, and they disfellowshipped me for that. They believe that when you, when you become, uh, when you leave the organization, you go to the devil anyway, but if you ever join a church, this is the ultimate sin. They believe that it's committing spiritual fornication with the devil. In my uh, job assignment at the Brooklyn Bethel headquarters, I would often process disfellowshippings which came in from all the various congregations in the United States. And they literally amounted to hundreds that would come in every week. It just shows the, the magnitude of the number of people that are disfellowshipped by the organization. And, of course, careful records are kept on all of this. And, and including all the, the intimate details of uh, what the individual did, what kind of offense it was. Mainly there are sex offenses, but there are other offenses too, like uh, smoking, uh, perhaps celebrating the holidays, uh, things like that, that people also got disfellowship for. If uh, one actually becomes a dissenter to the point of becoming apostate, then we follow the Bible counsel and we uh, never invite him into our house or would say a greeting to him. If a person resigns, they are treated exactly the same as a person who is disfellowshipped. When my husband and I resigned by sending in a letter of disassociation, 
We were not merely dropped from membership. We were actually shunned as being evil. Even today, if a Jehovah's Witness is caught associating with us, they are subject to being disfellowshipped themselves. There is no honorable way out of this religion. Because of the way that they had treated my family, I disassociated myself from the Watchtower Society, never dreaming that my children would refuse to have anything to do with me. In fact, I have a little two-year-old grandson that I've never even seen. My two children and my five grandchildren are forbidden to see me, their grandmother, because of the Watchtower. What kind of organization, going under the heading of Christian, would disallow the children and grandchildren to see their mother and grandmother? Every person will recognize the Watchtower's practice of shunning as a cold, unloving, evil thing. The lives of the disfellowshipped are filled with the chill of loneliness, the never-ending sadness of separation from family members. To find something to believe in, to trust in, is very hard. Since I believed that they were the only channel to God, I couldn't bring myself to come to any other church to search for God in any other way. Normally, Jehovah's Witnesses are taught that when they leave the organization, there's nowhere to go. But my wife and I, through Bible reading, found out that we could go to Christ. And that's what we have done. After I'd ran across some literature that exposed their false prophecies and their deceitful ways of covering up, I then was able to realize that they weren't God's organization, and I was able to search for God. And I found Jesus Christ, and He is my personal Savior, and He's changed my life just a hundred percent. We just uh, prayed and gave our heart to Jesus, and it seemed like such it was such a simple answer, but that was that was what we've been searching for all our life, and it wasn't an organization. It was Jesus. It was a personal relationship with Jesus that we didn't have before. We knew at that very moment that our names were written in the Lamb's Book of Life. It was, it was a free gift, eternal life just given to us. And all those works that we did, all the thousands of hours that we, that we put in for an organization, all the hard striving was finished. And just grace, just grace saved us through faith, just a simple act of obedience and prayer and asking the Lord to take over. And just filled us with joy and peace, a joy that we never had never had as a witness. Marjorie and I spent many years working for the Watchtower Society, but it wasn't until we left the organization that we discovered the real meaning of God's love. Our experience says to us that there's another ministry out there for Christians, a ministry that will come knocking on their door. The Jehovah's Witness who comes to your door is a person who's lost his way. If you're prepared, you can reach out and show him what true Christian fellowship is. It's been a long journey for us, but we don't think it's been wasted. The remainder of our years are going to be all the more precious to us, because now we have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We finally came to realize that eternal life is a free gift. God's grace was all we needed, just grace.